The night of the 31st, we took the train down and, sitting on the back platform of the last car, dangling our legs, the snow swirling in our faces, we toasted the new year. How I wish that we might have had many more such experiences together. Roy Dykeman Chapin was born in 1880 the third child of Lansing attorney Edward C. Chapin and his wife, the former Ella King. Lansing was still in its horse and buggy days. The streets, the state capitol, and the more prosperous dwellings lighted by the warm glow of gas lamps. Paving by modern standards was non-existent. In rainy weather, the fringe top surreys and the six and eight horse freight wagons plowed through mud halfway to the wheel hubs. The Chapins lived comfortably, but modestly. Edward was not an ambitious man. His favorite client was the Michigan Central Railroad because they gave him free passes. Witty, kind, and conspicuously honest, he was content to do his job in life well and to travel as far as the Michigan Central Rails could take him. Ella Chapin was a tiny woman, but was clearly the driving force in the household, the energizing spark of the family. Blessed with a quick mind, she loved being active. A blend of his father's interests and his mother's driving force, Roy, even as a child, had a certain vision. Young Chapin's vision took concrete form in photography, his favorite pastime as a youth and an interest he would maintain throughout his life. As a boy, he built his own camera. And then he built a business, photographing classmates storefronts, dignitaries from the state capitol, public events, for anyone willing to pay 10 or 25 cents for a print. The family's modest circumstances meant that he could have only two years at the University of Michigan. But Roy was clearly committed to make the most of them. Along with his freshman liberal arts curriculum, he also took law classes. It was as if he knew even then that there would never be enough time. During his second year at U of M, Roy learned that a former Lansing neighbor, Ransom Olds, had become an automobile manufacturer. Taking a page from his father's book, Roy caught the train for Detroit to see the Olds factory firsthand. After a test ride with an Olds engineer pushing the envelope at the blinding pace of 15 miles an hour, Roy raced, on foot, into Ransom Olds' office and begged for a job. It is indicative of Roy's persuasive skills even at 21, that he was given two, putting together the first auto catalog to make extensive use of photography and test driver. The Olds Proving Grounds were located in the wilds of Belle Isle. Mounds of dirt thrown up from digging the canals served for hill climbs. A bigger challenge came with the development of the now famous Curve Dash Olds with its breakthrough $650 price tag. For a car priced that low to succeed, Olds would need to prove its reliability in a way more dramatic than bashing around Belle Isle. This was the age of Barnum, and someone advanced the notion of driving from Detroit to the upcoming 1901 New York Auto Show. This would be an arduous 860-mile trek over the kind of roads that routinely swallowed wagon wheels whole. That is, where there were roads at all. The job fell to the young test driver. On Sunday, October 27th, Roy took off, with the car loaded with as many spare parts as it could hold. Crossing at Niagara on a suspension bridge, Roy found conditions even worse. At one point, he diverted onto the Erie Canal towpaths, scaring the mules and bouncing over the tow ropes with occasional forays into hayfields. Still, he persevered, arriving at the Waldorf Astoria Tuesday evening, November 5th. Because of his tattered personal appearance and the even worse condition of the car, the doorman not only refused him valet parking, he insisted Roy go around to the service entrance. Safely inside the hotel, he found Ransom Olds and informed him of his successful mission. He also sent off a telegram to his colleagues at Olds Motor Works in Detroit, reporting the good news. Although it was an unprecedented achievement, as a promotional device, the trip was only a partial success. The repeated breakdowns had caused Roy to miss the auto show's opening by three days. If only he had had more time. 
Still, the stunt enabled Olds to tap a huge new market. It also helped attract some new talent. An inventor named Howard Coffin, whom Roy had befriended during his brief stay at U of M, joined Olds in the engineering department. Olds also attracted other bright young men, including B.R. Jackson and Fred Besner, who would stand with Roy and Howard Coffin in later ventures. The New York trip also marked Roy as a star, and he was shortly named Olds sales manager, the youngest in the industry. Displaying his father's passion for travel, he thoroughly covered the United States, developing new markets and refining his ability to charm and persuade. He talked riverboat fancier Mark Twain into attending his first auto show. Despite their best efforts, however, Roy and the other young Turks at Olds realized the company wasn't moving fast enough to suit them. This part of the story, where Roy's lifelong proclivity for partnership is officially ratified, is best told by the woman who became his lifelong partner in words she addressed to their oldest child many years later. Roy Dahlin, the date February 28, 1906, was a significant milestone in your father's career. The articles of agreement drawn up on that day constitute his first steps as a manufacturer into the highly competitive field. Five days previous to this day, he turned 26. On the 1st of March, 1906, he resigned from the Olds Motor Works. The only assets the boys had were Howard Coffin's design for a motor, Fred Besner's contacts with suppliers of parts, your father's organizing and selling ability, and their courage, vision, and confidence. How or by whom the Articles of Agreement would be implemented was anyone's guess. In San Francisco, your father met Mr. E.R. Thomas. Mr. Thomas was a successful manufacturer of the Thomas Flyer, built in Buffalo, New York. He had money and a dealer organization. Here was the solution of their problem. With his backing, the yet unborn company could become a reality. Your dad presented to Mr. Thomas the idea that his company needed a lighter, cheaper car to reach a broader market with the resultant profit possibilities. Whatever your father's approach to Mr. Thomas, whatever his argument, he sold himself and his idea. The Thomas Detroit Company was the result. Mom. Thomas Detroit proved a successful venture with cars rolling out in 1906. In a move toward greater independence, the partners evolved the company into Chalmers Detroit, whose cars hit the market in the summer of 1908. Complete independence and the fortune they had sought came in a venture which at the outset the partners thought of as hardly more than an experiment. R.B. Jackson collaborated with Coffin on the design of the Model 20, a car that would sell for under $1,000. My father and Howard Coffin and Fred Besner were the three uh, motivators, let's say, and uh, the joke was, what's the product going to be called? You know, you can't call it the Coffin car. It, nobody can pronounce Chapin, and Besner was sort of a off-beat off kind of a name. So it, I think at the strategic moment, and I uh, won't be precise as to what had happened, Mr. J.L. Hudson came along with what I understand was $25,000 to start the little company going, and that's where it came from. And I can't think of a better one they could have picked. Amicably outboarded from Chalmers, Detroit, and financed by Detroit retailer J.L. Hudson, the Hudson Model 20 was born. Along with the name came the Hudson Triangle Badge, which officially symbolized performance, service, and value, but unofficially stood for Chapin, Coffin, and Besner. With Hudson smartly launched, Roy launched himself on a European trip. Displaying not only his father's love of travel, but his mother's sharp, incisive mind, Roy investigated the automotive manufacturing centers of England and the continent, which were well advanced of those in the U.S. He paid particular attention to anything the Europeans were doing with closed car technology. The vast majority of cars produced in America were open, which as Roy's New York adventure so vividly demonstrated, exposed driver and passengers to all the discomforts of the weather and rendered them unpresentable upon arrival. 
automobiles, he believed, would never fully conquer America until someone figured out a way to produce closed cars economically. Despite the successes of American aviation pioneers such as the Wright brothers and Glenn Curtis, Europeans were much more interested in flying than were Americans. Roy's vision for this country called for all forms of transportation, developed and working together, and he filed away everything he saw in the aircraft industry for future reference. Back in Detroit, the partners again engaged architect Albert Kahn, who had earlier laid out the little Thomas Detroit plant. This would be a much larger facility, and the work of a man now recognized as a major figure in industrial architecture. In front of the plant was a two-story office building of concrete construction faced with stucco. Although Kahn's commercial architecture could be somewhat conservative, he occasionally displayed daring ingenuity. Happily, one such occasion was the Hudson display room in the office building in front of the plant. Kahn used the exposed structural steel beams as a decorative element. It quickly became apparent that a big factory was a good idea. The company was growing fast, and by the end of 1910, Roy D. Chapin was a millionaire in his own right at the age of 30. Success gave the partners a certain freedom to get about. But for men like Roy and his friend Howard Coffin, getting out of the office often took such forms as designing a new Hudson model on Sapelo Beach in Georgia, where the Coffins had bought an estate. Whatever their origin, a growing list of models like the Hudson 54 rolled out of the factory to the pleasure of a wide range of customers. Performance became a major theme in Hudson promotion. January of 1916 saw the introduction of the famous Hudson Super 6, which soon struck it rich on Pikes Peak. With the company moving at full speed, Roy's evolving vision moved him to take on greater challenges. Penning numerous letters and articles, he championed the automobile and the industry in various forums but the major part of his public activities would be the cause of better highways. As far back as 1905, he had begun a pattern that was to last throughout the rest of his career. At the age of 25, he was appointed chairman of the Good Roads Committee, and he was a delegate to the fifth annual convention of the National Good Roads Association. When in 1913, a friend of his initiated the Lincoln Highway Association with its goal of establishing a satisfactory through route from coast to coast, Roy signed on as vice president and worked tirelessly to win the financial support of other car makers. Roy was also ahead of the curve in recognizing the role that the federal government would play in highway development. He worked hard to secure the support of his fellow car makers and lobbied the motor clubs and the automotive press for the 1916 Highway Act, setting a pro-highway national policy that paid benefits for generations to come. With the coming of World War I, Roy's service would be on the civilian side, but it would not be lacking in battles. He was named chairman of the new Highway Transport Committee in November 1917. He fought through bureaucratic resistance to successfully organize huge convoys of trucks to facilitate their shipment over there and promoted gasless Sundays to conserve domestic use of fuel. After the war, working as a great persuader and consensus builder, Roy prevailed upon auto industry executives like Edsel Ford, Alfred Sloan, Walter Chrysler, John Willys, Charlie Nash, and others to join him on the road to Washington and to make their views known to their senators and representatives, to cabinet members, and at the White House. In recognition of his leadership and his vision, in March 1927, he was chosen as president of the National Automobile Chamber of Commerce. On the other end of things, Roy also became an advisor to Presidents Coolidge, Hoover, and Roosevelt. An even more public recognition of Roy's leadership came with his role in the dedication of the Zero Milestone in Washington, D.C., where he shared the podium with President Harding. Evidence of the boundlessness of Roy's vision can be found in the fact that he sought and won U.S. support for such events as the Pan American Highway Commission and the Sixth Congress of the Permanent International Association of Road Congresses. Indeed, his efforts on behalf of roads and the automobile industry were so widely recognized, even on the international level, 
that the French government elected him an officer of the Legion of Honor, roughly the equivalent of knighthood in France. In the first decades of the 20th century, motor racing was hugely important in winning acceptance for the automobile and publicizing individual nameplates. The Vanderbilt Cup was the big race of the era. It traveled from city to city like an automotive Olympics. Savannah, Georgia Mayor George W. Tiedemann, a rare public official interested in highways, had worked to bring the Vanderbilt Cup to his city, and his efforts were rewarded in 1911. When Roy went down for the races, the talk was not about highways, cars, or racing, but about the Tiedemann's beautiful daughter, Inez, who had been a noted beauty since her teenage years. No stranger to the camera. She was something of a celebrity, college athlete, socialite, and drop-dead beauty. He didn't want to meet her at first. There was a Howard Coffin, who was sort of between the age of my father uh, and my grandfather. So anyway, Dad was on his way out west on some train, and he received a telegram, which wasn't in those days, from his friend Howard Coffin, saying this is the last and final invitation to come and meet Miss Honest Tiedemann. My father went to see her, and supposedly was surrounded by nine men. Now, again, this is probably an exaggeration, eating chocolate cake, and he took one look at her and fell very much in love with her. Roy saw only her a long-limbed girl, graceful and at ease. He saw lovely chiseled features, a rippling mouth, and blue-gray eyes. Inez, looking at the new visitor, saw a grave, dignified, rosy-cheeked, still young man in a dignified brown suit. His manner was serious, reserved. Then came the radiant smile. The industrialist, the sophisticated world traveler, the tycoon disappeared before her eyes, and standing there was a rather tall boy in a dignified brown suit. All enthusiasm, energy, and fun. The contrast was striking. Inez was intrigued. Roy was more than intrigued. In the time it takes to make a snapshot, he became convinced that he had at last met his real partner. Roy's campaign to move Inez from intrigued to something more committed was staged in a series of beautiful, even breathtaking settings. And though Inez was treating him coyly, he had the presence of mind, or the confidence, to photograph the exotic locations in his trademark panoramic style. He followed up their infrequent and all too brief meetings with a torrent of letters, when I drove down along the shore and saw that wonderful big round moon and thought of the moonlit nights we've talked together, you can easily imagine how lonely I felt. We must see this same moon together before it is all gone, but it is for you to determine when and where. Another time he wrote, Remember what I told you the last day at Bass Rock? All my time and all my movements are for you to direct. Maine, New Mexico, Europe, none of them count anymore. Simply tell me where it will be and I will come. I'm thinking of you constantly, Inez. Can you feel it? Lovingly, Roy. The famous Chapin eloquence, however, for once was unequal to the occasion. In early August, she turned down his proposal and left for Karsten Hall. Persistence, however, was a Chapin strength. On August 19th, Roy arrived in Savannah. A smile from Inez gave him encouragement. He proposed again that very evening, and this time Inez said yes. They were married within two months, just enough time to put together a spectacular wedding. The honeymoon at the Park Grove Inn in Asheville, North Carolina lasted one month, presumably ending when Roy ran out of panoramic film. Although Roy was as much a man on the go as ever, he was a changed man. He and Inez were completely absorbed in one another. Their greatest pleasure was to be together, alone, in the house on Beverly Road into which they had moved after the honeymoon. Roy had found his life partner, and so had she. 
By the early 20s, with highway development well underway and post-war prosperity ready to kick the American market into high gear, Roy decided it was time to deliver the car he was convinced everyone was waiting for. Recalling perhaps how cold and uncomfortable he was on his epic Detroit to New York journey 20 years before, Roy believed a closed body would allow Hudson to tap a huge new market, if he could get the price low enough. Drawing on the intelligence he had gathered, he introduced such cost-cutting innovations as modular construction, making the left and right doors from identical stampings, and using identical glass panes for all four windows. The resulting brand new Essex coach, introduced in 1921, virtually eliminated the premium charged for a closed car. Essex quickly became a bestseller. A closed car with more amenities and prestige than the Model T had suddenly become affordable. At that point, America's taste in personal transportation changed drastically. In 1916, virtually all of the cars had been open-bodied. By 1929, nearly 90% were closed. As Edsel Ford noted, Roy was always such a modest fellow that I wonder how many people realize what I believe was his greatest contribution to the American public and to motor travel everywhere. I mean, the Essex coach. He was the first one of us to realize that the public wanted a closed car, if they could get it at the price. The revolutionary Essex transformed the automobile from an enthusiast toy to the family car. No surprise then that behind it all was the work of a family man. Sweetie, what do you suppose that these kids of ours are going to turn out to be? Well, judging from Roy's tendencies now, I imagine he might prove to be an inventor because anything that he can think of to do odd jobs that he has to do himself will be most welcome. He's a very lazy boy. You know, that gal Joe of ours, she's kind of lazy, too. She just takes her clothes and throws them all over the floor. Oh, but you wait. She'll earn money if she has to ride in a rodeo to hire a maid to pick them up for her. She'll <laughs> fix that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that little fella Jack, you know, uh, uh, he's, he's kind of noisy, and I've, been, I've got a great hunch for him. What's that? Well, you know, down in the, at our factory this year on the new line, <coughs> we've got two mufflers on our cars and we've got a muffler on the intake. I think that that's the way we'll have to put out Jack for the 1933 model. All right. That's Sally of ours. We'll have to put her in charge of the complaint department. There may be rice or potatoes or macaroni every other day for luncheon. It's different, but her complaints are always the same. Well, she's going to grow up and get over that, too, I'm sure. How about our little Dan? Oh, he's a little bit clumsy. He goes to pick his sister up and he knocks her over and says, <laughs> 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 well, uh, Time will tell. You probably turn out to be graceful. He may be a real dancer yet, that boy. Well, maybe. Well, Marion, you know, she's a funny thing. She's the most determined member of our family, and I'm not accepting either you or myself. You better not. <laughs> well, what's she going to run? Well, I think she's going to run the Hudson Motor Car Company. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of give and take in a big family like this, and they'll have to learn. They will learn. Well, speaking of giving, do you know that they're the most generous children, I think, that there are in the world? Well, whenever there's a celebration, a birthday or a Christmas, they certainly prove that they think of others. Well, they sure are thoughtful. I think so. Congratulations <laughs> on them. <laughs> <Okay, then. laughs> Somewhere between the arrival of Sam and Dan, with the house on Beverly Road bursting at its seams, Roy and Inez got serious about building their long-planned permanent home. They knew what they wanted, saw it in their minds, and then hired someone capable of building it. We were agreed that we both liked 18th century Georgian architecture, softened by the American tradition. Of all the houses we saw, we admired most those built by John Russell Pope, and selected him as architect. In December 1925, we purchased property on Lakeshore Road, Gross Point Farms. We broke ground in March 1927. John Russell Pope was one of America's most prominent architects, 
and the Chapins were definitely hands-on clients. As it came to life, the new house became an object of fascination in American home building for its combination of respect for tradition with the modern expression of the owner's personality. As noted by an architectural critic of the time, it was evident from the beginning that Mr. and Mrs. Chapin wanted a house which fulfilled their own conviction as to what was fine and beautiful, not just a house that would look well and be adequate. Even the opening of the house was handled in the inimitable Chapin style. In December 1927, when the house was near completion, it happened that the Infante of Spain, Don Alfonso, first cousin of the king, was planning a visit to Detroit and was most eager to see the great motor plants. Roy was asked if we would be hosts. He, of course, said, yes, with pleasure. We would have a housewarming. It proved to be quite a job, but a lot of fun. The house was not yet completed. There were no rugs or hangings. The mantles were not installed. Even the stairs had not been stained. By four o'clock the next afternoon, almost everything was complete. And then, friends came to the rescue. The Edsel Fords, Kanslers, Barnbrights, Schlotman's loaned furniture, Irish glass, and old silver. The housewoman had been arranged, as well as a dinner and a reception, with all the requisite correctness of formal invitations for royal guests. After the introductions, a string quartet of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra played chamber music. At midnight, George Gershwin sat down at the piano and played on and on into the early morning hours. While that was a special night, it couldn't hold a candle to Christmas, which was always a magical time in the Chapin household. Indoors by the fire and outdoors in the snow, the family came together to share the joy of the season and mark the passing of time with a charming tradition. The house that served royalty now served as background for a series of photographs, begun in 1932 for the family Christmas card, that shows the growth of the Chapin clan. As they grew older, the children were not beyond second-guessing their parents' carefully laid out architectural vision. Sammy, unhappy that while there were two tennis courts, there was not one swimming pool, took advantage of Inez's absence one day to dredge up all the water lilies and goldfish from the wall fountain to make it deep enough for swimming. Inez was soon home to make things right, but the pull of great events would continually intrude on Roy's attempts to be with his family. In November of 1929, Roy was taking the outdoor-loving Roy Jr. to New Mexico to attend the Los Alamos Ranch School it was one of a number of treasured father-son train trips, but the pleasure of the journey was marred by interruptions. He uh, took me out to Los Alamos. This had been in 1929, uh, and on the Super Chief, and just the two of us, and, and you'd seen to me at every stop, they would hand him a telegram, the good old yellow Western Union telegram, and he'd say, now wait a, wait a minute, and then he'd write a quick response and give it back to the station master, whoever it was that had given it to him, and then the train would take off. And this went on, you know, three or four or five times in the course of crossing the U.S. And finally we got to Lamy. He said, son, I have great faith in you, and here's a fellow that will get you up, at least as far as Santa Fe. And, uh, and I said, well, what's going on? He said, I'm taking the next train back. He said, the, the market is absolutely disintegrated and I have got to be, I, I got to go home. So he never got to the school with me. And, and, I, and, and I, I thought myself, Mike, can you imagine what was going on in his mind when he was getting these deadly telegrams and only being able to respond by saying, either buy, sell, or don't do something. Determined to literally lift Hudson's sales, which had plummeted following the stock market crash, Roy decided it was time to act on his long-held interest in aviation, now that it had become the American public's fascination following Lindbergh's historic flight. His plan was to apply aircraft imagery to the automobile, and the resulting car was named the Terraplane. Pulling out all the stops and introducing the car to the public, Roy engaged one of the biggest celebrity flyers of the day, Amelia Earhart.
Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very happy occasion and one which we surely have a good right to celebrate with mutual congratulations and a spirit of optimism. Those of us who fly owe much to those who have pioneered and developed the automobile. Perhaps our largest debt to the motor car is for its part in making the general public conscious of the advantages of high speed and mobile methods of transportation. I christen the Essex Paraplane. Shortly after the launch, another prominent aviator helped Roy make the aviation connection. Orville Wright stopped by to pick up his car, Terraplane number one. To help ensure the Terraplane's success, Roy embarked on the auto industry's first extensive use of radio advertising. In the air, it's aeroplaning. On the water, it's hydroplaning. On the ground, hot diggity dog. That's terraplaning. Even more than in that slogan, the intimate connection that Roy saw between the auto and the airplane can be seen in this attempt to bring the technologies together for a practical purpose. But even as Roy's vision sought the heights, the ongoing depression dragged him down and continued to pull him toward Washington and Wall Street. President Hoover called, not for the first time, asking Roy to become Secretary of Commerce. Reluctant to take time away from the management of his company in a time of trouble, Roy nonetheless accepted the President's call to service. Mr. Chapin, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Department of Commerce as you assume the office of Secretary. More jobs as a result of continued improvement in business conditions throughout the country. A nationwide movement is now being actively pushed in an effort to divide up existing work and return our unemployed to their natural industries and occupations. At a time when it was extremely uh, inconvenient, let's say, for him to leave the automotive industry, he went to serve as Secretary of Commerce. And, and he, when he came back, he, he, that was one of the things that resulted in his death, in my opinion, was that he just overworked so, trying to catch back up the, the, the slack or the lack of momentum that had occurred at Hudson during his absence. Roy died on Inez's birthday a sad reminder that there was not enough time. Still, before there was an I-75 or even a Route 66, there had to be a Lincoln Highway. Before there was a Mustang or a Corvette, there was a terraplane snaking up Pikes Peak. Before the United States could become the most mobile society in history, somebody had to put the closed car within easy reach. Roy D. Chapin saw it all, and he had the drive to bring his vision into reality for all of us. Mm -hmm.